So, in today's lecture, what we will do is we will uh, look at another application where we can possibly get a simplified solution for a fluid flow problem. Okay? And uh, the idea is we are not going to be doing stability analysis, we are just trying to get a solution now to a problem which uh, wherein we can exploit the presence of different uh, length scales. So, uh, this uh, particular problem is going to be called a shallow cavity flow. So, as far as uh, shallow cavity flow is concerned, first of all, what exactly is a cavity? So, just think of a rectangular channel, okay, and uh, let us say there is a top plate which is moving with a particular velocity u0, okay. So, there is a fluid which is confined here. And this is the rectangular uh, channel and let us say as always it is extending to infinity outside the plane of the board. So, we are looking at the story in this two dimensional uh, plane, okay. So, no variations in the uh, direction perpendicular to the board. So, what we expect is that uh, this liquid is going to be dragged by the top wall and it is going to circulate, well, definitely can penetrate the wall. So, you have this kind of a situation. So, actually this is a very classic problem. This problem is called the lid driven cavity and uh, this is one of the first problems people solve in uh, computational fluid dynamics. So, you write down the uh, equation of continuity, equation of momentum in x and y directions and then you solve using some numerical method, okay. So, um, this flow field is uh, obtained using computational fluid dynamics, okay. So, the question of course is whether we can actually make some kind of a simplification and uh, get some idea about the flow field, okay, and uh, under some conditions. So, when you talk about a shallow cavity, we are talking about a cavity whose depth, let us say this is the z direction and this is the x direction and let us say the extent in the z direction is d, that is this distance and the extent in the x direction is L, okay. So, if d by L is very much smaller than 1, okay, and we have a shallow cavity, okay. So, What we would like to do is analyze this problem and uh, see if we can get some idea about the flow field inside, okay. By exploiting this uh, factor d by l being very much less than 1. Now, um, where is this important? So, for example, you can have thin films. Okay, or you can have maybe even uh, microfluidic devices. So, supposing you have uh, a very thin film of liquid on a solid surface, and either the lower surface is moving or and the upper surface is exposed to atmosphere, okay, you would have a situation where this is a thin film 
and that's the direction which is being dragged, for example. And this, of course, instead of a solid, solid wall, you'll have a solid gas wall. But again, the business of these two length scales is going to be present. And so, basically, the presence of these length scales, d by l being very much less than 1, d by l is a small parameter. You can think of already an epsilon coming up here, and how I can possibly use this epsilon for simplifying equations and getting some insight. That is the idea. Okay. And uh, microfluidic devices, for example, um, we long back spoke about something called a slug flow. And uh, the basic idea in a slug flow situation is supposing you have a two phase flow, and let us say this is oil and this is water. You would have things like oil slugs almost occupying the entire channel, okay, uh, separated by water. So what's going to happen? The oil is going to be flowing, okay, and uh, there's going to be a continuous stream of oil drops or oil slugs flowing, and uh, of course there's also water present here, which is also flowing. Again, if you do what we did yesterday, that is work in a moving reference frame, that is you are sitting on the oil drop and moving along with it, it would be like the oil is stationary and the wall is moving backwards, okay. Sitting in the water uh, uh, occupied portion and moving, again the wall is actually moving backwards. So what you can see is, when you have this kind of uh, relative motion between the wall and this, you're going to have internal circulations inside the slug, okay. In the moving reference frame, we have, let us say, we forget about the film, this guy is moving backwards. So, this is something like your lid-driven cavity problem. Okay. Only thing is, instead of solid walls, I have a liquid-liquid interface. I am just approximating this to this. Okay. And uh, what I am going to observe is, I will have some kind of a flow pattern of that kind and a flow pattern of that kind here. So, some vortices are induced. Okay. So, the point I am trying to make here is, when you have this kind of a slug flow regime, you would have, because of the viscosity, you would have vortices induced, okay. And the one way to understand this is to look at this problem in a moving reference frame. So rather than look at the, uh, the because actually this is an unsteady state problem because at any instant of time, you will have one particular a portion occupied either by oil or by water, okay. So just like yesterday, we were went to a moving reference frame. I go to a moving reference frame and I say, look, the walls are moving backwards, the liquid is stationary. And what this means is you have these internal circulations. Now, we, what we want to do is we want to understand these internal circulations because that is going to help in mass transfer and the heat transfer and things like that. So when you are trying to do some kind of a reaction and let us say there is some species here which has to be transported from the aqueous phase to the organic phase or vice versa, this flow is going to actually help in moving the species. Okay, so what one wants to do is one wants to understand how these vortices are actually going to be developing and whether we can get some idea about the magnitude of the velocity. Of course, one approach is do CFD, okay, and the other approach is see if we can get some insight without doing CFD. And like I told you at the beginning, what you can do is you can get these analytical solutions, get some idea, and if you are really interested, you can do a CFD and get a more rigorous solution and in some limit, the CFD can be validated by this analytical solution because at the end of the day, CFD is going to always give you some nice pictures, nice graphs and results, but the numerical accuracy of these results can be verified only by uh, uh, verifying this and some limit for example. That gives you some confidence in your CFD results, okay. So the idea is in a moving reference frame, the wall moves back. Okay, and in each slug, we have internal circulations, okay, 
the internal circulations and this is important to uh, understand mass transfer for example in reactions. So typically what will happen is there will be some species here and another species in this phase both have to come together to one phase for the reaction to occur okay and this convection is going to be deciding the whole thing. So how do you go about analyzing this? So the point I am trying to make here is this problem is very similar to that problem okay. You have a rectangular wall and uh, the only difference is the boundary condition here. Here I, I have a solid wall but here I have a liquid liquid interface but if you uh, neglect the fact that it is going to get deflected that means again perpendicular component of velocity will be 0 but you will have a tangential component of velocity for example okay. So how do we go about, so this is just for motiv uh, motivation for doing this kind of a shallow cavity problem okay and typically in micro channels the slug length can be 5 to 10 times that of the diameter. So maybe we can push our luck and you know uh, try and get some understanding of the flow field here using the uh, shallow cavity limit. So what we will do is um, look at the flow in the original problem that we had in the shallow cavity and this is the problem dl maybe I will do uh, what has been done in Gary Lee u0. So in Gary Lee he has uh, this business I think this is the x direction and that is the z direction. The lower plate is the one which is moving in the u0 with a velocity u0 in the positive x direction okay. Clearly what is going to happen is liquid is going to get dragged and it is going to form some kind of a uh, vortex okay. Now this whole problem can be analyzed by dividing this entire domain into two parts okay. The central portion here which is the core region and the portions on the other two sides which is the near wall region. Okay. So I am dividing the entire domain into two portions, the central portion which is core and here where the fluid is actually going to be bending backwards. So there is a difference in the physics in both these regions. For example, if you focus somewhere in the central portion of the core region, you do not have the effect of these walls okay. For all practical purposes, you can view the flow as being almost parallel, only thing is the flow is the positive x direction in the lower portion and in the negative x direction in the upper portion okay. Whereas here and therefore for all practical purposes you can imagine that the vertical component of velocity is 0 I mean in some limit of course there is a small vertical component of velocity but uh, that is going to be negligible whereas here the vertical component of velocity is going to be comparable to the horizontal component of velocity okay. So in the core region the u and w sorry uh, w is much smaller than u whereas near the wall the w is 
comparable to u. Okay. We are also going to look at, so you are looking at microfluidic applications and very small channels and the flow through these small channels, the characteristic Reynolds number is going to be very low. Okay. So, you are talking about very, very slow flows. So, what we will do is, we will try and analyze this situation using the low Reynolds number limit. So, rather than write everything and then put Reynolds number equal to 0, I am just going to at the beginning itself put the inertial terms equal to 0, write my uh, equation of continuity and equation of momentum. Okay. So, let us do that. So, um, we focus on low Reynolds number flows, which means uh, we drop the inertial terms on the left hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations. Okay. And uh, what am I left with? The equation of continuity which is du by dx plus dw by dz equal to 0 and then 0 equals minus dp by dx plus mu d square u by dx squared plus d square u by dz squared okay. and 0 equals minus dp by dz plus mu So, what I have done and gravity I am not worried about just imagine the gravity is actually absorbed into one of these pressure terms okay, as a gradient. So, this is your modified pressure. So, that is my equation of continuity, the y direction is outside the plane of the board I am neglecting. So, this is the regular thing that we have. So, what we want to do is we want to simplify this make it dimensionless. Okay, and uh, then exploit the fact that d by l is very much lower than 1 and see what kind of simplification we are going to get. So, see this business of the length scale in one direction being much smaller than the other is something which is you have seen in uh, boundary layer flows for example. Okay, the thickness of the boundary layer is very, very small. So, what is the argument you make over there? You say that Look, in order for the equation of continuity to be satisfied for both the velocity component, both these terms to actually contribute, okay. Um, the characteristic scales which are written down there, that W is much smaller than U, we need to have an estimate. Clearly, what is the characteristic scale in the, of the velocity in the x direction? It is U0 because that is the lower plate velocity. What about the characteristic velocity in the W direction? that is going to be decided by the problem here in the sense that both these terms have to contribute okay. and uh, I am going to scale the length in the x direction with L and the length in the, y di the z direction with d because those are the characteristic scales in the uh, respective directions. Okay. So, u characteristic in the x direction is u0, x characteristic is L and Y characteristic is, oh sorry, Z characteristic is D. Okay, and uh, we need to know what is W characteristic. Okay, so clearly I'm going to substitute this here. I'm going to get D U star by D X star, and this is U zero. That is the u characteristic, okay, and uh, L plus w characteristic by d zero or
0. Okay? So, the idea is that these two terms have to balance each other and they can balance each other only if this is of the order of magnitude 1 and so this implies that W characteristic is D by L times U naught or epsilon U naught. So, it is epsilon times the U characteristic. Okay? And uh, so, what I am going to do now is I am going to use this in my uh, momentum equations, make them dimensionless okay, and uh, get an idea about what is happening. What I want you to understand is in you know, regular flows, when you have a pipe flow, the pressure drop is something which you impose experimentally. Okay. Whereas in this particular problem, there is going to be a pressure gradient which is going to be decided by the flow. Okay. So, dp by dx and dp by dz is something which I do not know, it is something which I have to find out. Earlier in the, uh, the hagen poiseuille flow, you said because that is a pressure driven flow, that is controlled by you experimentally. So, you impose dp by dx and then you find out what the velocity field is, you get your parabolic profile. Okay. Here remember, the flow is going to be driven by the wall and so dp by dx and dp by dz is something which I need to find out. Okay. Um, okay. So, let us do this. Uh, I also do not know what is P characteristic because the P, the pre characteristic pressure is going to be something which is decided by the flow that is taking place and the fluid properties, clearly things like viscosity okay, and the dimensions of the channel. So, P characteristic is also an unknown. So, what I am going to do is I am going to take the x momentum equation, make it dimensionless and uh, idea is 2 by d x star times p characteristic by L plus mu times d square u by d x squared will give me u 0 Squared, okay. I like to get d by L out, so I am going to take out d squared and the z direction I have d that comes out, so I have d squared by L squared here. Okay. Remember, this is made dimensionless with L, that is coming here, this, this is made dimensionless with respect to D, so that comes here, I am taking out a D, so that D comes there. So, clearly this D squared by L squared is epsilon squared. So, if I have chosen my characteristic scales properly, what this tells me is that the second derivative in the x direction is much smaller than the second derivative in the z direction. See the z direction my distance is very small, so that the variations are much sharper. So, when I have to compare these two, I can actually neglect this in comparison to this. Okay? So, basically this is an order of uh, uh, two orders of magnitude lower than this depending upon epsilon. This is an epsilon squared term. But what I need to do is, I need to choose my P characteristic so that this pressure gradient in the x direction is going to balance the uh, term in the z direction, the second derivative of the z direction. Okay? So, then only this will balance that. So, I am saying I am going to neglect this compared to this. Okay? So, this is epsilon squared. That is epsilon squared and I have 0 equals minus dp by dx times p characteristic by L plus mu u naught by d squared times d squared <coughs> d z star squared. Now, p characteristic 
is chosen as mu u naught times L divided by d squared or mu u naught by L times 1 by epsilon squared. Okay. So, basically the uh, characteristic pressure which is actually developed inside the uh, cavity is given by this. Okay. So, if you choose this, then this becomes equal to that and your simplified equation of moment, uh, momentum in x direction is minus dp star by d x star plus d squared u naught u star by d is a square. That is your dimensionless equation of momentum. Okay, so, this pressure force basically the two important forces are the pressure force and the viscous force. Okay, gravity anyway you are neglecting, inertia is gone. So, that is and there is something very similar to what you ha have seen in your second poisonal flow. You have pressure and uh, you know your viscous force. Only thing is I need to account for this guy bending back and all that and dp by dx is not known to me. Okay. So, now um, let us do the uh, other direction 0 that is the z momentum equation. Okay, That is what we have to do and uh, what I will do is go to the other side of the board. So, I am going to start with this. by d is z star, this is p characteristic which I know and this is which I found from that and this is going to be given by d plus mu times w characteristic is u0 times epsilon, okay, that comes out and I do my usual stuff which is uh, bring a d squared outside here, right and I am left with Okay. So, I have the same stuff L coming as the characteristic length scale here. So, that L comes there, this gives me D, D comes out, D comes out, that D goes there. Okay. So, now remember what is P characteristic? I already found out what P characteristic is. I am going to substitute that here and I am going to get using the P characteristic we get 0 equals minus dp star by d z star plus mu u naught epsilon by d squared times a d which goes there and p characteristic is coming in the bottom which means I have epsilon squared divided by mu u naught and there is an L here. Okay, times between these two terms, this is much smaller than this d squared w star by d z star squared. Because this is epsilon squared times that. Okay. So let's simplify. I get d by L as epsilon, d by L is epsilon, right? Yeah, that epsilon, that epsilon goes off and I get 0 equals minus dp star by dz star plus epsilon square times d square w star by dz star square. So, in the limit of epsilon tending to 0 or if you actually did a perturbation series solution and if you found out the solution in terms of a power series, okay. So, what you would get is 
in the limit of epsilon going to 0, this term is going to be negligibly small compared to this, okay. So, if you look at that, the terms are of order epsilon to the power 0, this is going to give me minus dp star by dz star equals 0. In other words, the pressure variation in the z direction is not there. Clearly, the region is so thin in the z direction, for all practical purposes, you can actually neglect the pressure gradient in the z direction. Whereas, the pressure gradient in the x direction is given by um, this momentum equation which we wrote over there, okay. So, basically what we have done is we have used the fact that epsilon is very small and rather than do a very formal power series expansion, what you should do is now you should seek p as p0 plus epsilon p1, w as w0 plus epsilon and then equate coefficients, but uh, those equations are independent of epsilon, the epsilon is occurring only here. So, I am just getting the 0th order solution directly by putting epsilon equal to 0, okay. I mean your 0th order solution or a base solution, how do you find just put epsilon equal to 0, you get a base solution. So, I am going to get the base solution just by putting epsilon equal to 0, okay. You can do a more formal thing like we did earlier and then uh, look at the first term, then you will get this. We need to solve and now I am going to drop all the stars, okay. Zero equals minus dp by dx. Zero equals by dz. These are the terms at epsilon to the power zero. These are the three equations which we have. So let's look at how we can proceed. What does this imply? dp by dz is 0 implies that the pressure is a function only of x, okay. It is too thin in the other direction, so you neglect the variation in that direction. This implies pressure is a function of x, okay. So if pressure is a function of x alone, okay, then I can integrate this d square u by dx squared dz squared equals dp by dx, that is from this equation, okay. From my equation in of the momentum in the x direction, d square u by dz squared is dp by dx, this is a function of x, I am going to integrate this twice, but since this is a partial derivative in the z direction, what I have is these constants that are going to come, they can actually be functions of x, okay. So, integrate this once, you get du by dz equals dp by dx, ah, uh, dp by dx times z plus c1 of x, okay. Integrate this one more time, and you get u equals dp by dx times z squared by 2 plus c2 of x. These guys are functions of x because I have a partial derivative. If I had a total derivative, it would have been constant, okay. So, remember u is go can be a function of x because the dp by dx can change with x, that is what this means. dp by dx, remember the function, p is a function of x. So, since pressure is a function of x, I am going I am allowing for the fact that u can change. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, in z, that is right. I thought I wrote z, but I guess I did not, okay. Now, you have to put those boundary conditions. What are the boundary conditions? At z equal to 0, u is 1 because that is how I made it dimensionless and at uh, z equals 1, I have u is 0 because the upper wall is uh, stationary, right. So, when I put z equal to 1, when I put z equal to 0, I have u equal to 1, okay. That tells me c2 is equal to 1, c2 of x is 1. u of 0 equals 0 implies 
c2 of x equals 1, okay, and uh, at z equal to 1, u is 0, and 0 equals dp by dx times half plus c1 plus c2. So, c2 is 1 and that was c1 is okay, that is c1. So, now I actually have the expression for my velocity u is dp by dx times z squared by 2 plus c1 is, oh man, c1x is dp by dx times half minus 1 times z plus 1, okay. I am going to group my dp by dx terms together. Which one? Minus dp by dx. Minus dp by dx. Here, here. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, as always, you guys are right, man. And this is minus, right? So I need to put a minus here. I think that is it. So, that is your velocity field and it is something like, uh, it is a parabola of course hmm? and remember, but have you solved the problem? Yeah, we need to find w, but uh, we, but we know u, we know we do not know u because we do not know dp by dx dp by dx is something which I do not know. I need to find out what is dp by dx. Remember, it is not that I am imposing a pressure gradient, it is a wall which is moving. So, how do I find out dp by dx? I need to use some condition about the flow. So, let us look at to give you an idea and to prompt you, yeah? Yeah? So, I am looking at the core region, right? And in the core region, how is the flow? Somewhere on the top is going from left, uh, right to left, the bottom is going from left to right. And uh, for all practical purposes, you have this uh, kind of a flow. Now, what do we expect? Is there a net flow across this line? You have a confined liquid liquid is confined, whatever liquid is going to go from left to right, we have a steady state situation, okay. Whatever liquid is going from left to right must be the same as the liquid which is coming from right to left, okay. So, what that means is the volumetric flow from left to right must be balanced by, because there is nothing, the liquid is not leaving your two walls, you have two rigid walls the liquid cannot go out. So, whatever liquid is coming from left to right must actually come back from right to left. So, the total volumetric flow rate across this line must be 0, okay. And that means the fluid going from left to right um, I shall say the fluid, fluid, uh, the flow rate equals the flow rate from right to left, okay. 
which means the net flow rate must be 0 or integral u dz from 0 to 1 must be 0. Okay, because I have confined liquid and then I am just moving this fellow. So I am going to use that condition and of course I, I know u, I am going to use that and find out dp by dx. So I uh, put this here and uh, if you do the algebra, you will get this is used to find dp by dx equals 6, okay. I mean uh, you can just do this integration and you can find out that dp by dx is 6. So what that means is dp by dx is indeed a constant, okay. And there is something similar to what you had for your hagen boyle flow when you say that the pressure gradient is a constant. So if dp by dx is 6, now you go back to that equation. Earlier we said p was a, uh, a function of x, but I know it is linearly varying. So dp by dx is constant, which means that u is not a function of x, u is a function only of z, okay. This implies u is a function of z alone. It is independent of x, okay. So u is independent of x, therefore what this means is you have something like a fully developed flow situation, du by dx is 0, okay. So that means du by dx is 0, I will just say it is analogous to fully developed flow. And from the equation of continuity, dw by dz equals 0 from equation of continuity. And since you have two solid walls, w is 0 at the walls, therefore w is 0 everywhere implies w equals 0 everywhere. So what we have done, so what have I done? We basically got an idea about what the flow field is at the 0th order when epsilon is very, very small, when epsilon is 0, okay. So the 0th order solution tells you that there is no vertical component of velocity in this core region where I am focusing, okay. Um, the velocity is almost fully developed, so there is no change in the x direction and um, the exact dependency on z is given by that, just put dp by dx equal to 6, you will get that. So you will get something like, I mean if you really uh, did the uh, and plot it or something, if you put z equal to 1, that has to be 0 which it is, and you put z equal to 0, you get some uh, 1 or something, okay. Yeah, dp by dx is 6, 3, yeah. This is z, is it? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is z, okay, that's the, yeah, yeah, then I am okay because z equal to 0 should be 1. I was wondering it is not satisfying the boundary condition after all of this. So yeah, now at z equal to 0, it is 0 and at z equal to 1? z equal to 0 is 1 and z equal to 1 is 0. Is that right, right? That is happening. That is good. If that is happening, then everything is fine. Yeah, z squared minus z plus 1 minus z, yeah. So zero dollar solution is like this, okay, and um, this is one. So if you actually plotted the profile, you'll get something like a parabola which is bending back. Like normally you have a parabola which is um, zero at the two walls, 
but here you have a parabola which is 1 here, it drags and then actually goes back to 0. Okay. So, let me see if I can draw this properly. If I draw this properly, it is 0 here and then it is something like plus 1, is it? Yeah, something like this. This is 0 and this is plus 1. Of course, this is plus 1. That is the value of the velocity. Okay. So, varying from plus 1 to 0, moves to the right and then bends back. This is also not right. This is also not right. I really need to plot this function. This is not right. Why is it not right? That thing goes beyond one zero. Yeah, that's right. This is not correct. This is not correct. So, what is the right thing? Clearly, this is wrong. Nothing goes beyond one. That's one reason, and the velocity has to be negative, and the way I've drawn it everywhere it's positive. Okay, so you need to draw it right, and let's draw it right for a change, which is going to be like this: this is zero, and this is plus one. Okay. So that's uh, basically one application for shallow cavity flows. And then you can do this also for the uh, near wall region and then you can do it for different boundary conditions and stuff like that. That's, um, I think with that we will stop.